everybody is a book of blood. Wherever we're opened, we're red. Have you checked the Benvenidos, Freight fans, and hellacious hedonistic heathens from across the globe. I am known as Jaime en Fuego, and I welcome you here to the Horror Show for the continuation of a new monthly segment entitled Bucker at the Moon! Ha ha ha! That is Reezy, obviously, Benvenidos, and welcome to the Horror Show. And this being the second installment of my coverage of the rad status British auteur both a artist, a writer, a, a screenwriter, in fact, a director. I mean, the guy is just a plentiful cornucopia of so much just sadistic and uh, repulsive awesomeness. We we're talking Clyde Barker. And uh, yes, so very stoked to be continuing with the Books of Blood. That's right. And so this is going to be covering the second volume. And in comparison with the first that I believe had six stories, if I remember correctly, let's just do that double check and sort of thing. So yes, the, the uh, first volume uh, covered the Book of Blood, which is essentially kind of the first portion of the framing device. And we also had the Midnight Meat Train, great adaptation with Bradley Cooper of that. The Yattering Jack, which unbeknownst to me upon the filming of this, was actually turned into a episode of Tales from the Dark Side from back in the 80s, the George Romero series. And then Pig Blood Blues, which was terrific. Sex, Death, and Starshine, intriguing. And probably my least favorite, but still intriguing nonetheless, was In the Hills, the City. So uh, I will have a link to that video in the description below and in also the uh, end credits and stuff like that. Uh, the, the, the end cards or whatever the hell we call them. But... Let us talk about the second volume of Books of Blood, which was released in 1984. It houses five stories in this particular regard. So we be talking, first and foremost, Dread. Now, uh, this is a story that was actually adapted in the 2000s into a feature film, albeit being a feature based on a short story, it had a lot that it was attempting to expand upon, but the story in and of itself is very simple, sweet, strange, and scary. And so that is because we have a main character by the name of Steven, and then it is basically Steven and this older guy at university that he becomes acquainted with by the name of Quinn. And so Quinn is about 10 years older than him, so he's in his 30s at that point, and so early 30s presumably, but it's definitely a just division of age, and the fact that you know somebody of that age is still you know studying at the collegiate level and everything, I know it's a little bit different over in Europe, obviously, but nonetheless, I mean, if you're in your 30s, you're either a teacher or you're you know trying to pursue like a master's or a doctorate or something of that particular nature, Sure. But um, uh, dude is most definitely, as I'm just trying to, uh, did I say Quinn or is it Quaid? Yeah, Derps Fuego. But so Quaid is essentially, you know, this older guy who strikes up this friendship with Steven. And yet Quaid is obsessed with just the element of dread, the idea of it. And being a philosophy major, he describes just any sort of philosophical rumination as the beast and how do you have to basically go and get it before it gets you and sinks its teeth into you and all of that particular stuff uh if you don't uh yeah yeah if you don't face the beast and the beast it finds you i know i'm kind of just uh, verbatim a little bit but uh the feature film came out july 14th july 14th uh, of 2009 and uh it made its debut in uh canada here in north america at fantasia fest and then in uh, march of 2010 the dvd was released here in the united states but just very interesting stuff as far as Quaid's obsession and the fascination that Stephen finds within it as their friendship starts to blossom, but then you have this woman by the name of Cheryl kind of come into play who she kind of fancies herself, I guess, as an intellectual equal to Quaid, but she finds out very quickly about just the borderline sadism that his fascination with dread and inducing it and studying it within other people becomes. And that's because she <laughs> becomes the victim of an experiment 
of his. And so they had struck up a relationship and Steve is aware of it and you know he uh, ends up uh, going on holiday during the winter break and when he comes back he reconnects with Quaid and gets the information that you know during the time away Quaid has not only got himself a living place that is surrounded by destroyed homes like rubble and everything so it is isolated and there is really nobody who would potentially be uh, just cognizant and aware of what sort of nastiness he may be doing. And the nastiness in particular is taking Cheryl, who Quaid describes as a pathological optimist, but also a self-proclaimed vegetarian. And so she acts as if, uh, you know, she has nothing, there's really nothing major wrong that she has ever done. And it's intriguing because Quaid describes it as uh, confidence has something big to cover within her. And so she has this this breadth of bombast and almost a borderline arrogance that he finds fascinating. And so he wants to get to the heart of what she is fearful of, what she finds scary. And it's described as there is no delight the equal of dread as living as it's someone else's, as long as it's someone else's, excuse me. And so, yeah, you can learn so much about not just yourself, but just humanity in general uh, by analyzing the just deepest fears, the dread of other people. You know, the real terrors are pre-personality, as if to imply that what I don't necessarily believe, you know, that phrase essentially says that, okay, you have, even before they manifest themselves, certain things that will traumatize you and continually, you know, be fearful of. But I think that there is an element, personally, with my father being a philosophy major and, uh, you know, has a doctorate in it, masters, all that different stuff. He, philosophy, ethics, he's, he was big time into it. And so some of that trickled down within me, not all of it, obviously. But I think that an element of conditioning, as I hint to that, really plays a major part into what induces dread within us. So perhaps there are some things that are pre-personality before, you know, we start to have that uh, formative cognition of, of things, but I think we are a victim of our own environments in that degree. Like, I don't necessarily think you would have a, a woman who, in the feature film, in some of the expansion that they do, is that uh, there is a major amount of study that uh, Steve and Quaid actually do. They bring on a, a new woman who is another character. Well. That's the thing, there's there's a couple women in it, and one, like, there's a lot of alteration, and in some cases amalgamation, certain traits are passed off to other people within the film. That's not to say that it's not effective, I'll give some more thoughts about that, but the the Cheryl character has the, the phobia of eating meat, and yet there's another character in the film who, briefly, as they're compiling interviews of everybody's dreads at this New York University, because it takes place in New York in the film. Um, yeah, she talks about how uh, you know, she was molested by a parent, uh, by, by a father. And so I think that that is very much like, you're not going to be traumatized by, you know, a sex and by just sex in general, unless you were a uh, just horrible byproduct of that environment of abuse. So that's where I would at least agree that, you know, real terrors are not always pre-personality as Quaid contends within this. But uh, as I always do, I try to at least pinpoint on some passages that I find very fascinating. And the very first paragraph that introduces Dread, the short story by Clyde Barker, I find tremendous. So let's check it out. There is no delight, the equal of Dread. If it were possible to sit invisible between two people on any train, in any waiting room or office, the conversation overheard would time and again circle on that subject. Certainly the debate might appear to be about something entirely different. The state of the nation, idle chat about death on the roads, the rising price of dental care. But strip away the metaphor, the innuendo, and there, nestling at the heart of the discourse, is dread. While the nature of God and the possibility of eternal life go undiscussed, we happily chew over the minutia of misery. The syndrome recognizes no boundaries in bathhouse and seminar room alike. The same ritual is repeated. With the inevitability of a tongue returning to probe a painful tooth, we come back and back and back again to our fears, setting to talk them over with the eagerness of a hungry man before a full and steaming plate. There's really good stuff in this story, man, and that is the one thing that um, I will definitely say I continue to experience within Barker 
in his writing, especially these early short stories from 84, um, and that he was working on, you know, in like a year or so previous, but there is such an element of sophistication within the observation that I truly appreciate. Um, and, and this deep examination of the human condition is obviously what philosophy is all about. And so as we go on further, and uh, this is about the time, that, okay, so this is more discourse, so let's jump right here. So, uh, uh, suppose Quaid had found this circular hell to put him in because it would never be found, never be investigated. Maybe he wanted to take his experiment to the limits. And that's because there is an experiment that goes down with Cheryl, where she is locked away, and basically the only thing that is left for her to consume as she is, <laughs> is as she is in this like prison of sorts, is a nice piping piece of meat. And that is really the crux of the third act of the film, is that this poor woman is locked away, and the only thing as a vegetarian she's left to eat is a nicely cooked piece of meat. And she resists for days and days and days, but eventually gives in, faces her dread head on, and just, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog sort of situation here. And yeah, she consumes this rotten, disgusting meat. They do it very convincingly and disgustingly in the Dread Feature film from 2009, so I applaud them there. But uh, there is somebody else without spoiling things, another character within this, who is also put into this sort of situation, and uh, it, it has to do with sensory deprivation, almost, and the fact that a character within the narrative had an accident as a child and lost hearing for a period of time, and describes very interestingly and convincingly the fact that when you can't hear, it's like you're a fish in an aquarium, and you can see the expressions and the mannerisms and all this other stuff, but the fact that there is just no actual sonic, uh, you know, interaction, it's very crazy, but uh, so, suppose Quaid had found this circular hell to put him in because it would never be found, never be investigated. Maybe he wanted to take his experiment to the limits. To the limits. Death was at the limits. And wouldn't that be the ultimate experiment for Quaid? Watching a man die, watching the fear of death, the mother load of dread approach? Uh, Sartre had written that no man could ever know his own death, but to know the death of others, intimately. To watch the acrobatics that the mind would surely perform to avoid the bitter truth. That was a clue to death's nature, wasn't it? That might, in some small way, prepare a man for his own death. To live another's dread vicariously was the safest, cleverest way to touch the beast. Good stuff, man. I, I mean, just so much, so much to ruminate upon. I really, really love it. And um, yeah, I, I just love also how there's kind of a snide viewpoint of uh, the enlightenment that allegedly comes with academic study. Academe had force-fed his mind, and just the aspect of when you're learning, especially at that you know higher university collegiate level, there is just so much jam-packed into your brain. I almost feel like it does become Kelly Bundy to a degree on Married with Children, where it's like there is a just there, there is a point where you can't stuff any more into the brain, and so it starts pushing other facts out. So uh, it does end in a very satisfying fashion where we find out the nature of uh, what Quaid's deepest fear is and some of the connections. And uh, it is one in particular that Stephen King himself, who praised the work of Barker, and it was put on the U.S. release of the first three books of Blood, would definitely uh, take appreciation within. And uh, this was written before a certain book uh, with just two letters in the title without spoiling things, but I do really appreciate the, the very end of this. There is pain without hope of healing. There is life that refused to end long after the mind had begged the body to cease. And worst, there were dreams come true. It ends on such just a delightfully dark note. I love it. This story is the shit. Um, the adaptation not quite as simple and lean and mean, but still very good. I liked the expansion, and I also enjoyed the uh, just injection of different characters. And the ending, it has some similarities, but I would say the ending is actually even darker to a degree. And uh, yeah, I didn't absolutely love it, but Dread, the uh, feature adaptation slash expansion, is available to watch for free on Tubi. So if anybody is inclined, if this is one of those Clyde Barker adaptations, unlike Nightbreed and Hellraiser and the aforementioned Midnight Me Train or Rawhead Rex or whatever it may be, if this is one that you have never seen, I definitely recommend it. Dread is a satisfying 
albeit, uh, you know, divergent adaptation, it's still quite good. So let's get into story number two. Not number two. Yes, in this case, you are Hell's Event. And Hell's Event is veering as we had a few times in the previous volume of Book of Blood. It's uh, kind of the, the yattering story, some of the dark humor that was prevalent within that. We get that in Hell's Event. And that's because apparently, since essentially the dawn of uh, just human time, I guess is the best, the dawn of civilization, let's use that term better. Um, there have been competitions between hell and between the uh, humans of Earth, and the stakes have always been very high. And as we join this uh, brigade of runners in this particular story, it has never been higher because if the, uh, the, the just emissary, the competitor from hell, uh, is able to win this, it will be hell on Earth. It will be the end of the world as we know it, to quote R.E.M. But nonetheless, uh, they have lost a lot of times, and they hell is attempting to stack the deck, so to speak, in this particular race. And so there is everything in this from the, just a person in Parliament there in England who is in cahoots with that ninth layer of hell. And I love the way they describe the interactions of those from all of the different layers and the distinctive aspects of punishment described in the Dante story that is so unique to each level. But yet, yeah, nine being just a freezing, just icy cold. And when there is the interaction with those both from down there and with those working in conjunction with them, most notably Gregory, the, the uh, politician who has essentially sold his soul to hell, uh, the fact that they are so, it's such a freezing cold environment. But I also like the fact that Barker describes the areas as smelling like goats and, you know, the sheep and the goats, if you're going to get all biblical with that shit. And I just found those unique descriptions to be quite fascinating. But so you've got Hell's Runner and then you have our essential main character, I guess, who is a seasoned runner and he has, some, there's some rivalries, you know, within the ranks and stuff like that. But the story, it's short, but it pans out in just a very captivating fashion, maintain my attention throughout, because there are familiars who have essentially taken on the role of those who have been killed in this area of Earth where this competition is taking place. And yet, I also love the fact that there is a, just some very good... Um, What's the word that I'm looking for? Just analysis of the nature of competition. And as somebody who played competitive sports up until injuries in my late teen years, and then with two younger brothers who play football real, as I call it, soccer here in the States, but uh, both of them played collegiately, and uh, one almost went pro until his second ACL tear. So I'm from a family of sports people, a family of competitors. My mom played college basketball. My dad was a big high school football guy, and uh, you know, coach of soccer and various other things. And so. I like this little passage right here where it says, uh, well, Nick Lawyer is really setting the pace at this stage in the game. We have some very funny anecdotes from the guy in the sky and the guy out uh, who was calling just the action there, there on the ground. But um, uh, Cameron always said, and Cameron is the trainer of our lead runner, our main character in a lot of ways, essentially. Let the others be heroes. That was a hard lesson to learn, Joel had found. When the pistol was fired, it was difficult not to go for broke. Unwind suddenly like a tight string. All gone in the first 200 yards and nothing left in reserve. It's easy to be a hero, Cameron used to say. It's not clever. It's not clever at all. Don't waste your time showing off. Just let the supermen have their moment. Hang on to the pack, but hold back a little. Better to be cheered at the post because you won than have them call you a good-hearted loser. Win, win, win at all costs. At almost all costs, win. The man who doesn't want to win is no friend of mine, he'd say. If you want to do it for the love of it, for the sport of it, do it with somebody else. Only public school boys believe that crap about the joy of playing the game. There's no joy for losers, boy. What did I say? There's no joy for losers. Be barbaric, play the rules, but play them to the limit. As far as you can push, push. Let no other son of a bitch tell you differently. You're here to win. What did I say? Win. Yeah. And that is just that diehard competitive mentality, which I, I do respect, you know? And there is an essence of competition as well, even in the creation of art, whether it's, you know, Stones versus the Beatles versus Beach Boys or whatever the hell else. I, I mean, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue, you know, what, whatever the hell it may be. And I just use musical examples, but I know that whether writing or whether, you know, you're a local artist and at all of the showcases in the art district, there is somebody who has a style perhaps a little bit similar to yours. And so there is that rivalry, albeit in on occasions a healthy one. Nonetheless, 
I think that th you want to create for the sake of uh, just expressing yourself, obviously, but there is definitely a different aspect, I think, where um, it can almost bring something a little bit better out of you if there is that motivation of competition. I know it doesn't work for everybody, but for some, uh, aside from even sports, I think it's it's a very helpful sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so uh, without spoiling the story, it does go down to the wire and it does get gory and crazy. We have like human faces melting off to show the real disgusting demons that dwell just beneath. And there's also an uh, anecdote that comes out quite a few times about there is this uh, demonic presence, you know, this presence of hell that is behind all the runners. And the example that they use is from the story of Lot, where they're fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah, and where his wife turned back and became the pillar of salt. And so, for the runners that they sensed something right on their heels, uh, but you can't, you, you cannot just divert your eyes and turn back and look, because it will, in fact, mean your demise and so yeah it's a cool story it has some of that uh, humor which i which i loved and uh, yes hell's event is pretty friggin cool man and as somebody who grew up with sports and who also did like cross country and track and stuff when i was in my younger years i did appreciate a lot of it so let's get to our third story and this is the one that while i appreciated it there our lead character who is by, by the name of jacqueline s She's a bitch, man. She really is. And she is very much, and that's just my opinion, artist objective, obviously, but she is very, 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 very much just solely concerned with herself is the nicest way that I can put it. The story begins with her in this marriage where she's kind of lost interest in her husband. She was so captivated by him initially. And now, you know, she said his kisses taste like stale bread or something to that effect, if I remember correctly. So she is, despite having what is implied by Barker is a pretty decent life, she's unhappy. And so she takes apart a razor and she slices her wrist. So she attempts to kill herself. But in the midst of her husband breaking down the door, taking her to be looked at and saving her life, essentially, she does discover the fact that she has this, this ability to push and to just make things that she is thinking manifest. And they are of the gruesome variety. So she is talking with this uh, doctor slash therapist after she has been saved and um, he's like, I'm going to get you better, you know, and two shakes of a lamb's tail. And she's like, what, am I a lamb now? You know, and she's thinking these things to herself. She's not vocalizing them. But, and then he says that, um, you know, uh, that, you know, he understands that women of her age have these sort of just personal crises and whatever. And of course, her response is, and perhaps this is a little bit more of a valid term, but nonetheless, I mean, if, if a woman psychologist or whatever is not available, I mean, her response is, what do you understand of being a woman? You're not a woman. Valid points, I suppose. But, I mean, you do still have to attempt to find some sort of neutral ground. And so this guy meets a very grotesque end as Jacqueline discovers the nature of these newfound powers. She basically turns Jude into a woman. And so breasts are grown, but in the process, his like rib cage is cracked. And so it's a very grisly end that said guy meets. And yet she isn't fingered for the uh, finger. Jesus Christ. Fuego. Uh, she is not a potential suspect just because she's in such a dilapidated state post attempted suicide. And so for that reason, yeah, they don't like investigators don't even think twice about her potentially having some sort of connection to this grisly death. And she kind of forgets about it for a little while, but then as her husband is revealing some infidelity and the fact that he is unhappy in the marriage as well, and the fact that he has been seeing somebody else who is nothing like her, she decides as she is remembering these capabilities, she goes after her husband. And it's probably even worse. Have you ever seen a human body folded? Almost like you're folding up a dress shirt or folding together a suitcase kind of thing? Yeah, and that's about as far as I can go without getting super spoilery. So she she kills some men and yet based on that she has to go into hiding because it's one thing with the doctor, it's another thing with her husband. And so that's about as far as I can go without saying too much more. But the half of the story is told from her perspective as the narrator and the other one is told from the perspective of a, a, a guy that she gets involved with uh, by the name of Bassi 
who just falls head over heels in love with her. Uh, he has a connection to her husband who died of cancer, uh, allegedly, as, he, as she tells him. And so, yeah, they have this, this whirlwind love affair. It affects Vassie's work, but yet he is so just completely enamored with her. And uh, he just describes, you know, to you who dream of sweet, strong women, I leave this story. It is a promise as surely as it is a confession, as surely as it's the last words of a lost man who wanted nothing but to love and be loved. I sit here trembling, waiting for the night, waiting for that whining pimp coos to come to my door again and take everything I own from me in exchange for a key to her room. And that's because um, they have their, and this is basically Vassie's retelling of their love affair after she kills her husband, and then also the fact that she goes into hiding, and at one point there's this character by the name of Titus, if I remember correctly, who she believes she can learn from uh, as far as ruthlessness goes, but also some sort of cognizance of how to keep her powers in check, as opposed to them just manifesting Sometimes where she just gets maybe overly emotional because women do that. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Every joke's half the truth, I guess. But uh, yeah, but to keep the not basically to utilize them in a fashion where she can't pick up the pieces, sweep the dirt under the rug and not be as easily incriminated, I guess. And so that happens midway through and the story jumps back and forth between Jacqueline and Bassie as he is trying to find her. He inevitably tracks her down to Amsterdam of all places and he is trying to reconnect with his love, and she is not in the best of places. And there's there's everything from blackmail to uh, just all kinds of different varying motives throughout this. But um, yeah, it's a it's an intriguing story nonetheless. And even her contempt for her husband before she kills him, mentioning a conversation. Ooh, it must be a public holiday. So just she does not like her husband <laughs> particularly in that regard, and. Just the longing that epitomizes Vassie within this. He is a he's a very relatable character for me, you know, in the hopeless romanticism that I have always found myself uh, both a a steward of, a champion for, and a victim of in lesser moments of my adolescence, especially, you know, and friend zoned and all that different things. But nonetheless, this is an intriguing story and definitely not what I would really expect from Barker. So that was cool. Let's jump to the fourth story. And the fourth story is none other than the awesomely titled The Skins of the Father. And this one actually takes place, believe it or not, uh, written by a British dude in my home, deadly desert state of Arizona here in the US. And I don't know if Welcome Arizona is an actual place, but nonetheless, uh, it is very much a part of our tale here. And that's because this guy from back east, he is driving through Arizona and his vehicle breaks down out in the middle of nowhere. And as he is looking around, just trying to see if there is any signs of life of somebody who could potentially assist him, he sees this like procession, this little par like parade of sorts going on in the distance. And as he goes to investigate, he's like, oh, those people must be in costumes because they're like, you know, the heads are like nearly 20 feet tall and they, they're just adorned in, you know, almost like these monstrous sorts of costumes. And he finds out pretty quickly that they're actual monsters when one chases him back to his vehicle. And, you know, Barker and all of his sexual deviancies, this thing's got like this big raging fucking boner as it's attacking him and everything going after him. But the, the creature is inadvertently, uh, presumably killed when it, it starts jumping on the vehicle and there is some gas and there's an explosion, whatever, car is totaled, presumably. And law enforcement eventually comes to investigate and that they find out pretty quickly, well, it may be dead, presumably, maybe it's not completely dead, or maybe there's just, it's almost like uh, how certain creatures can continue existing after like heads are off and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah the, the sheriff's hand, like a good portion of it is like chomped off. And But the real crux of the story, and when we get into more of the sexual nastiness that Barker is known at times for, um, you find out that there's this child by the name of Aaron who has an abusive, uh, father quotations by the name of Eugene and uh, Aaron was actually not born by the seed of Eugene. Aaron was born by when a bunch of these like almost like something out of uh, out of Nightbreed or um, Cabal I think is the, the the novella which it's based on but you know these creatures that have come up from you know the the deepest depths and they run a train on this woman, and their seed is actually what his fathered Aaron, named after the brother of Moses and all that stuff. 
And so apparently there are tales in this Arizona town um, going back to like the sheriff's father even talking about it and remembering that there is a uh, time every X number of years where these creatures, they come up and they are just going around amongst the humans and, you know, the, the terror, although there's also kind of, uh, it's, there's some implied benevolence at times, but yeah, they don't kill this woman when they're all taking a turn so to speak, and then Aaron is born, and yet Aaron is a very docile, kind of meek-mannered kid, and that's how Eugene is able to facilitate his resentment significantly more, because he's like, that's not my son, you know, because he's like, he's making, well, making love, he's banging, he's, he's just, he's making sex on his wife, and he is like, as it's described by Barker, thrown off, and then all the creatures jump on and take a turn, it's really gross, but in any event, uh, it turns into the sheriff like basically mobilizing some peeps and getting a bunch of old uh, just stuff left over from the war weapon wise as far as like bazookas and you know explosives and you know artillery and stuff like that and intending to track down these monsters and to, yeah the, the mother is there and Aaron and Eugene you know the abusive father and also our character whose vehicle is broken down and so they are they basically go after the monsters and without spoiling things too much there is a big confrontation going on. These creatures want Aaron, you know, based on the, you know, creature connection, so to speak. And there is a beat that we later on see, I'm not gonna say recycled, but reappropriated is a better way of putting it. Uh, near the end of Lord of Illusions, the Clyde Barker film based on The Last Illusion, the one with Harry Demore. And uh, if it's one of the most iconic bits in the film where there's a bunch of cult uh, members who are like pulled into this like, this dirt and the dirt start like it gets moist and they all fall in almost like quicksand and then it all starts to harden and it's a really grisly grotesque sort of thing that happens to some characters in his and it is horrifyingly described and I, I mean for fright fans like me it's awesome so not going to spoil how everything ends in the skins of the father or fathers plural but nonetheless I was intrigued and also uh, just the fact that it takes place in Arizona uh, Arizona's not all desert, though, Mr. Barker, as I'm sure he knows from having lived in Los Angeles and probably spent some time. Go up to Flagstaff. Go up to, you know, the, the White Mountains. It's forests. It's very, very different. So as to um, kind of clarify the, uh, often miscon the often misconception. So, And then we get to the final story. And similar to in the first volume, the final story is my least favorite. It's not to say that it is without merit, however... This is entitled New Murders in the Rue Morgue. And New Murders in the Rue Morgue, you have any familiarity with the Edgar Allan Poe tale, you're probably gonna see where this may be going. And so I think the Poe story was like 41, 43, 45, something like that. Anyway, mid 1800s was when Poe came up with this. And it is interesting how it's folded into the narrative here, even though it is almost like a a requel sort of thing, or a requel, as they said in the new screen movie. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, yeah, you have the revelation that our lead character, our narrator named Lewis, his grandfather had apparently related the story to a young writer by the name of Eddie on some travels in America, the story of the murders in the Rue Morgue. And yes, if uh, you're familiar with the Poe story, you know that there is... Um, there's something that is not human. It's a particular animal that uh, is responsible at, uh, as the detective uh, eventually discovers for these murders. And uh, that story, as at least in, in Barker's new murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, was a real tale that actually took place. And his grandfather, Lewis, our, our, our main guy, he actually related that story to Edgar Allan Poe, who in turn, turned it into a story, and so, yeah, so that's an interesting sort of connective tissue, I suppose, but Lewis has a friend by the name of Felipe, who is back in Paris, and they are old friends from like 50 years uh, back, you know, before World War II, when they had some of their best times, uh, him, Felipe, and Catherine, who I believe is a friend or his sister, god damn it, I'm trying to remember, but nonetheless, uh, yes, the three of them had a bunch of wonderful times, and so when Catherine actually phones Lewis and is like, uh, Felipe, uh, uh, Philip Felipe, you know, he's been uh, accused of murder, first degree, and if there's any way you can come and see your old friend, console him, and if there's any way that you can assist, please make the journey, of which he does from America over to Paris, to, to France and everything. And if 
If you're familiar with the Poe story, you're probably going to be able to guess who actually perpetuated this crime, but it takes it, it definitely takes it to a further degree than what we had with the original Poe story, as far as that particular non-human was still very much in its primal state, so to speak. There is an aspect of domestication that this story entails, which is probably the most interesting aspect of it. But um, yeah, aside from that, this is the one that I have the least amount of notes about because I found it the least captivating. I found it the most predictable. There is, I, I mean, it's gross too, especially in the fact that this takes it way further than Poe's story as you would expect from, uh, yeah, from old Barker, uh, the bestiality Barker. Ah, I guess I implied what, what goes down in here, but yeah, it's, it's not a bad story, but at least for my personal taste, it is the most predictable and the weakest link of the five tales that I just got done discussing for the Books of Blood, the second volume. I will be returning sometime next month in March to discuss the third volume, and then in turn in the coming months thereafter, there's going to be four, five, and six covered as well. So very much excited about that. I know typically on these Terror Tuesdays, Tower Tuesdays are actually what they are, and I discuss Stephen King uh, for hail to Stephen King. That is still every other Tuesday in the month here on The Horror Show, but uh, I extend a gran gracias for anybody who tuned in to this discussion about Mr. Barker. I've been Amin Fuego. You can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube. For those checking this video out today, here on Tuesday, February 8th, on my personal YouTube channel, Infuegotainment, I have a video going up that's going to be discussing all of the Oscar nominations for 2022 that were just announced today. So some insights, some predictions, all of that fun stuff. So if you want any sort of non-spectacular stuff, check that out. And uh, also anything else, uh, you know, spectacular that we cover on here, like, share, subscribe we greatly appreciate it and uh yeah that is going to be the end of the proceedings to all of the scarific fans of Clyde Barker and I most definitely implore you if you get the opportunity to check out his stuff books of blood with all of them being short stories is a great place to start but there's all kinds of other awesomeness between the aforementioned cabal hellbound heart uh, you know great and secret show like I have back there uh, the man is prolific even if his uh, just amount of releases isn't quite as insane as my beloved side king. Barker is still a badass. So uh, until next time, Freight fans, remember to stay scared and in this case, read Clive Barker.